All right, so this is our first session um, where we're going to explore ethics in healthcare profession. Okay, so it's not just only for doctors, it's for um, all the other healthcare professions. It's very important and, and very useful to, to know. Um, this is the, why do we do medical ethics? Well, we do this because it comes up time and time again in um, interviews when you're applying to um, medicine. It is also very, very important to know for any other healthcare profession course that you apply to. So for nursing, whether that be nursing or veterinary sciences or even um, dentistry, okay? So on the screen you can see that there is a framework that we can use, all right, when we're looking at ethics. First of all, do you know what we mean by ethics? Yeah. Okay. So how would you describe or what would you say ethics is? I always view ethics myself as right now is more a lot of, you know, values, you know, and you know, yeah, plus, you know, they can be personal, they can be institutional, mm -hmm. you know, they can be, you know, uh, you know, for a field, and that's how I. Okay. So kind of like what's right and what's wrong. What's the right way to do things? So that a moral, in, so like the moral kind of um, responsibilities can be met. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so there is a framework that we use to help give a kind of practical approach to ethical decision making. All right. And it falls upon four main principles that are widely used to deal with eth ethical uh, scenarios. All right. So. The way you go about it is to, if you're confronted with a situation or confronted with, um, you know, a problem or, 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 an, or, a, or an idea that you have to work out the ethics behind, we look at it in terms of four main pillars, okay? What do you think those four main pillars are? Autonomy. Autonomy. Beneficence. Non-maleficence. Very good. Non-maleficence. And justice. And justice. Good. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go through what each of these four are, and we're going to think of examples, and there'll be some lovely videos along the way as well to kind of uh, drive home the point for each of those, okay? We won't go through all four in one session, okay, because uh, we are looking at examples, right? Um, but one thing to note is that when we have one of what more than one of these um, ethical pillars in conflict with another, that's when we have an ethical dilemma. So we need to know a what these are and examples of when these are demonstrated in healthcare um, situations and scenarios, and then we need to be able to use these four different pillars to justify or explain our cause of action or course of action in a particular um, situation. Okay, does that make sense? So like you have a situation and then you think about what's the autonomy um, involved with that situation? What's the beneficence involved? Non-maleficence and justice. And are any of those four conflicting with each other? And if so, we have a dilemma and we need to try to kind of like weigh up what the best cause of action is, um, giving as little impact or um, negative impact um, as, as we can, okay? So that might involve like, thinking about what's most beneficial for the most number of people or what's not going to cause so much harm for um, as little people as possible, right? So, yeah, so that's what we're looking at here. So we're going to start off with the four principles of ethics on a video. So autonomy is the right of the individual. Every individual has a right within healthcare. So you can see that we have consent is important, privacy, confidentiality, and human dignity and rights involved with autonomy. We've got justice, which is the right to the individual. So the individual has specific rights in some healthcare um, provision that they're given. So we need to think about what's equal and fair, what's non-discriminatory, uh, what's fair, um, and uh, any stigmas involved. Then we've also got beneficence. Benefit, good to the individual. We want to provide good um, uh, outcomes for an individual when giving them health care. And we also don't want to give them harmful um, situations when giving them health care, which was the non-maleficence section there, okay? 
So it's important to think about, uh, when you're thinking about ethics, historical as well as legal implications of any decision making that we're making when dealing or giving any healthcare provision. So here we have all four. We've got definitions and, and a little bit of um, explanations for each four. And it's really important to remember this. What I want you to do is try to remember these. Later on, I will ask you to take each of these four different principles in turn and come up with an example where one is, is being um, considered, okay? So first of all, we got from the video that um, uh, quite a lot of this already, but we're just taking it a little bit further. Autonomy is the freedom of the patient to choose. So when you give health care to a patient, if they have their right mind, all right, if they are mentally able to make a decision, they, um, they, they should be given that choice, okay? So they have the freedom to choose um, how they want to be um, looked after uh, and be an advocate for their own health. You as a healthcare profession cannot advocate solely on their behalf. It has to be their choice, okay? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about autonomy. Beneficence, what's in the best interest? What's the most beneficial for the patient needs to be considered, okay? And that's what we mean when we're considering beneficence. When we're considering non-maleficence, we want to do something that's not going to in some way cause harm. So all treatments in some way can cause some kind of harm to a patient. Let's think about that. If you're a surgeon and you want to take out a gallstone, for example, or remove appendix, actually you are needing to you know, create an incision and uh, start to kind of intrusively do things with that patient in order to then remove things that are causing them harm. But at the same time, surely aren't you cutting them in order to go into their body to try to support and help them? So, you know, that treatment in itself is causing some sort of harm. Or aspirin, for example. Aspirin, when people take aspirin as a tablet, that can sometimes be that have some side effects, like bleeding on the inside on an empty stomach of, of, of your stomach, right? That's causing some sort of harm. So we need to counterbalance non-maleficence, not causing harm to beneficence. That means weigh up what the fact that we're causing some sort of harm relative to the good. Okay, that's what we've got to think about with maleficence. So the benefits in certain actions should be balanced against the amount of harm it can do, as long uh, it is as long as been considered to be part of the doctor's duty of first do no harm. But if you were to keep, that sh keep to that idea strictly, then you wouldn't actually be able to do so many things as a healthcare profession, right? You wouldn't be able to prescribe some medicine because there are always side effects, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it has to be dealt with in terms of thinking about common sense and legalities and so on as well. So that's why sometimes you need to say, do you want me to cause an incision in order to help perform a surgical, um, a surgical uh, treatment, asking them if that's what they want actually is not only thinking about beneficence and non-maleficence, but also autonomy. You're asking for their permission. Do you see how they all tie in together? And justice is equity and the avoidance of unjustifiable discrimination. Sometimes it can be just <laughs> argued justifiably in order to create more beneficence. So see, again, we could have some um, balancing of scales and, and judgment calls when you're kind of weighing up beneficence against justice, okay? Is it going to cause them more good or not, okay? So normally we would have a discussion between you and somebody else in pairs where you talk about the principle of autonomy and how it can be applied to A, abortion, and B, um, physician-assisted suicide. So instead of us having a conversation uh, in pairs, I'm just going to ask you, first of all, do you know what abortion is? Yeah. Can you see the idea of autonomy being applied to abortion? Yeah, most definitely. Okay, so how, how do we need to consider autonomy in abortion? How are they related to each other? It's, I know abortion's a tough one because, yes, it's their body, 
but at the same time, at a, you know, it's a very, it's a very fine line because it's a there's a life form in that too. Yes. And they don't get a choice. Excellent. So it's a very fine line of yes, the person bearing it needs to have a the choice. mother. Yeah. The mother has got autonomy over what's happening to her body and, and decision making, yeah. right? But yeah, go on. The point, fetus. Yeah, the fetus. You know, if you have an abortion, they don't have, they don't get any autonomy over their body and their life, which is why it's such a debate in so many places. Exactly, and there are so many viewpoints as well on kind of abortion in general, whether or not it is ethically viable or morally v something that should happen. You know, you've got other factors like religion. You've got so many different opinions on on it as as a you know an idea in itself in the first place, right? to the person but then that fetus is not involved in that decision making process but then here, here we have the other issue of who's responsible for a child or even a fetus's decision making process are they in a right mind or in a position to be informed and make a judgment about what's right for them or not in terms of healthcare in general just children in general let's start with that mm, well children in general I know in the eyes of the law, there are very specific things, and you have to be very careful of, that you're not allowed to consent to. And I believe you can have, you can be a responsible minor. I think 16 plus, but I think below that, a lot of treatment to think you need parental yeah. consent. So we got yes, exactly. So we've got the idea of parental consent before a certain age, okay, and also we have the idea of. Are these children deemed to be able to make an informed decision themselves and actually understand the um, implications of healthcare decisions that are being placed among them? That's children in general, right? Now, enter the idea of fetus and abortion. It makes it more complicated, doesn't it? Because, of course, they don't have the ability to make the decision themselves. They can't even process ideas yet because at this stage, you know, neurons and and, and brain uh, development is not even in a position to understand the alphabet, let alone complex ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. But then it is that moral issue of what's right and wrong about whether or not can the mother make the decision about life and existence itself on another human being or potential in the future human being. Yeah. So it's a very contentious issue. So autonomy is a massive thing when dealing with that. Now... Do you know what physician, uh, physician assisted suicide is? No. Okay. Well, what is it? It's, uh, I usually know by the time you stand here, but it's basically if someone asks basically to have their life ended, um, they can ask, well, there's this idea that they can ask for like a doctor or someone to help them do it. Okay, good. So suicide is obviously a person choosing to end their own life. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Physician assisted is basically doctor assisted, right? So it's like a doctor supporting that to happen. Why would that happen in the first place? Well, <coughs> this is often for people in palliative care or people who are... Palliative care. What does that mean? Well, uh, end of life care or people okay. who are suffering immensely. And yes. And they just, they, they're, they're, they don't want it anymore. And they just, they just want, the, you know, they just want it to end. They want the ability to choose to end their life because their life will continue to happen if they're in a terminal disease for example or in palliative care which is where they are um, just trying to l reduce the effects of pain towards the end of life right that's where you're going um, so basically they want the decision to be able to allow somebody to support them to, to, to do that so for example motor neuron disease is a terminal dis disease right and um, and so having the ability to, it's slowly what happens is um, the motor neurons stop working slowly, usually on a limb, and then slowly stop, and movement stops as the ability to fire and trigger um, neuron impulses, well, impulses down the neuron to make muscles move, and uh, you know, eventually that builds all the way up the body until it reaches the essential um, essential systems such as the circulatory system and the respiratory system so that means heart and lungs doesn't it so eventually autonomous processes which is basically automatic processes that you don't think about as in like your brain is automatically sending impulses to pump the heart or to breathe that ability to send those signals to make that happen from the brain is taken away right so that's motor neuron disease so in that case slowly more and more and more 
the ability to you know move to do things you become like unable to have any motion so that is something that is a disease that's closely associated with um, physicians assisted suicide right now there's another issue here involved as well the law okay <clears throat> so actually in the uk it's physician assisted suicide is actually illegal so someone with motor neuron disease cannot ask for that to happen okay well they can ask but then they'll be referred to um, people that will deal with their mental health to then you know talk about how well um, how autonomous how in their right mind are they however in places like switzerland it is legal so obviously the idea of are they in a sound judgment right mind to make that autonomous decision will be judged and deemed first and then the legal implications allow that route to happen. That means, you know, they'll allow that to happen, right? Does that make sense? Right. Okay, another video. Welcome back. In this video, we'll talk about the ethical principle autonomy. Autonomy refers to the patient's right to accept or refuse treatment, given that the patient has all facts regarding their treatment which means that the physician is required to tell the patient about the treatment provided, and they should also tell them about the risks and benefits of the treatment. Yeah, excellent they points. they should also tell the patient about the alternative treatment. But the decision to whether or not accept the treatment goes back to the patient. Hmm. And they should make the decision of whether or not to accept or refuse the treatment without any influence from the physician. So what the physician should not sway the patient's decision and alter it. For example, let's say that we took a blood sample from a patient who was complaining of fatigue, and we saw very low platelets and RBCs with very high WBCs. This is highly suspicious of leukemia. So the physician goes back to the patient and explains that their findings are consistent with leukemia. And then the physician recommends that the patient do marrow biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Now, legally and ethically speaking, here is where the physicians drop in. They explore the causes and discover the diagnosis, and they provided the management options to the patient. Now, autonomy gives the patient the full right to accept or refuse a marrow tap. If the patient refuses the bone marrow biopsy, this might lead to worse complications and even death. Now, in this case, the physician has to explain this outcome to the patient. Now, the treating doctor has to respect the patient's decision and not judge them or try to alter their decision. They can explain that it's a bad idea, but that's as far as they go. Now, autonomy can work both ways. The treating physician can have autonomy of their own. For example, if a pregnant woman is in her third trimester, and she requests cesarean section from the treating physician. But the treating doctor knows that this patient can deliver vaginally with no problems and that there are no medical reasons for cesarean section. In this case, because the treatment is elective and optional, the physician can practice their own autonomy and refuse providing this treatment. And here's a small quiz. Try to see whether or not the patient in this scenario was given autonomy. What do you think? Mm. I'll let you read. Sorry. Uh, I've seen it. It's, a, it's a tough one, but I would. I mean, I would say it's a slight break of autonomy because the doctor insisted. Yeah. Yes, it was a positive outcome, but he still insisted. So ethically, he still. Good. All right, guys. That's all I have for watching, and I'll see you guys later. Next one. Hi everyone, let's take a look at patient autonomy. Now, patient autonomy is similar to freedom of speech and religion. Patient has a right to refuse any treatment. Uh, each patient has a right that his wishes be carried out even if he loses the capacity for the same. This is valid even if he loses consciousness. What I'm trying to say here is on what patient autonomy eventually means is that each patient has the right to do whatever he wishes for 
uh, his body as long as he understand the effects his decision may have on his health or life. Now, better understand it, let's have a look at MCQ. Now, a patient is brought to the emergency department with a history of sudden onset of abdominal pain. On examination, he had abdominal guarding and rigidity in his air under diaphragm on x-ray. He was advised laparotomy and was explained the details of the procedure. Despite understanding the procedure in detail, he refused to undergo the procedure. What is the most appropriate step at this point? Respect his wishes, do not perform the procedure. Take consent from the wife and do the procedure. Or leave the patient to die or refer to another hospital. Hmm. What do you think? I'd say yeah. Because really I just you gotta respect the decision. I mean that's the point. Of Due to autonomy, yeah. yeah. Um, what's the correct answer? The correct answer is you respect his wishes and do not perform the procedure. As long as you've deemed him why is that so? As long as you've deemed him to be in terms of understanding the procedure and its effect and in right mind. Okay? No, the reason is if you have a look at the question you might think that the patient is insane or the patient is in uh, such a bad health that he does not understand but we are not the ones to decide that uh, capacity is taken for an adult capacity and understanding of it explain about the procedure as the mcq really states and the patient has uh, the right to say yes or no to any treatment even though that treatment may kill him hence that's the correct answer so the point to take home is a patient is assumed to have the capacity to make the decisions for himself and capacity is always taken for an adult. So beneficence is basically doing good, okay? So it's important to promote the patient's welfare, okay? That's ultimately what we're trying to do as a healthcare profession, to help to A, promote and make sure that everybody is not in pain, and we're doing good for, for their health. Um, competent, we have to have competent delivery of that health care, whether it's dentistry, which we've got here in the example, dent, you know, delivery of dental care, or whether or not that is um, the delivery of um, any other type of medical care. So it's a service to the community as a healthcare profession, all right? You need to make sure that um, you are... Uh, following the, the governmental rules of the profession and research and development and, and so on and, and be aware of all of these other kind of issues in, in involved such as kind of patents, abuse, neglect and, and so on. So, a dentist has a duty to promote the patient's welfare. The dentist primarily has the obligation to service, it is to service the patient and the public at large. Uh, most important aspect of this obligation is the competent and timely delivery of dental care within the bounds of clinical circumstances that are presented by the patient, with due consideration being given to the needs, desires, and values of the patient. And also, they're in a contract of obligations, and, and so the, the, the contract does not excuse dentists from their ethical duty to put the patient's welfare first. I'm going to come up with a scenario here for you. So one minutes and eight. And we're going to consider beneficence in this scenario. Kevin is just a few years out of school and working as one of six centers in a medium-sized private group practice. Recently, Kevin learned his practice manager changed his treatment plan for his patient from a simple restoration to a more lucrative full craft. What would you do? Accept the reassignment and continue work? Confront the practice manager about the change in treatment plan. Ignore the change and continue with his original treatment. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about what we've got here because, you know, Medics Club is also for dentistry and, and, and so on, right? So, there's a change of treatment plan for a patient from a simple restoration. Do we know what a restoration is? I believe so. Well, from what I believe, a restoration, no, my dental terms aren't great, but it's a restoration or reconstruction of a part of a tooth. I believe it's usually half up while a full crown is like a full on, I believe, I believe a full crown is the whole tooth.
from yep. the vat as well. So restoration is kind of helping to ensure that you're restoring the original to as much as possible. A filling, and you just, you're trying to fill that filling in. You might need something else along the side to help to make sure that happens. But full crown means basically drilling down further, right, and having a full crown being put in, right? So we're going from a simple restoration where you're just fixing a little bit, maybe just putting a bit of a filling in, to a full-on crown where you're stuffing more stuff inside the hole, therefore drilling more into potentially a salvageable tooth. In, in itself, so we're going further into it. Now, in the US we have more issues involved with healthcare, as in like, things are a lot more expensive. So you, they, and, and there are a lot more people on um, private healthcare plans, um, including with dentistry, and we do have a certain amount of NHS, NHS dentists in, in the UK, but it's still the majority have moved to private as well. But you do have the issue of opening up to where they may actually try to give a more expensive procedure in order to put more money into the practice, okay? So that's what we're looking at here. So what would you do in that situation, okay? Would you accept the reassignment and continue working, confront the practice manager about the change of plan, ignore the change and continue with his original, original treatment? So we have quite a few issues here and conflicted ideas. Would you accept it and say, yeah, I know it's wrong, but I'm doing it anyway, that's the first one. Or say, no, this is wrong, um, what are we going to do about it, I'm not happy with this. Or um, ignore the change, ignore what you've been told by your m people uh, above you, in charge of you, and then just carry on with what you think is right. Okay, that's what we're looking at with one, two, and three. Kevin decides to confront the practice manager and is told not to worry about it and that the patient's insurance will cover the crown completely. In addition, he is told to concentrate on keeping his production up and not discuss the case further. So again, ethically, we have more issues there. Who is ethically responsible for the patient care and the patient treatment plan? Kevin? He is the practicing dentist. The owner dentist. Kevin is simply an employee. Patients must be responsible for the type of health care they receive. Okay, so what do you think? Who's ethically responsible? Is it Kevin who's doing it, doing the uh, treatment? Is it the owner dentist or is it the patient? Do you think the patient's aware of what's going on? No. I think, I, I don't think it's as clear cut as that. I mean, either the owner definitely should, as he is the owner, have, of course, an obligation, but they both have, in my opinion, a pretty equal obligation. I mean, the owner needs to, he's the owner, um, he's running this business, but he's also, it's, I, you know, I, I like to view medicine as less of a business, more as a care yeah. and, a, and an aid, and yeah. you know, being lucrative about that, I don't think is good. It's not in the best interest yeah. of the patient, is it? Yeah. So basically, beneficence-wise, when you're looking at the four pillars, what's good for the patient is not to do the full crown, even if it's affordable, yeah? yeah? Go on. And I also say Kevin, he of course, even though he's an employee, still has a responsibility, because yes, someone told him to do it, but he is still doing it. Yeah. And so he is he is still he still knows that it's not in the best interest and he has still decided that what his owner says is more important mm. than what's in the best interest, which is ethically, I think. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Okay, good, good, good ideas. So yeah, I think that one he's confronted and uh, that hasn't worked. So I think that he needs to go and understand that he, yeah, he is responsible, Kevin himself, as well as the owner dentist, okay? And that he needs to also state why this is not um, um, something that he should be doing due to the beneficence and the, and the good of the patient, okay? Now, we'll finish off with this little video here. I, I enjoy this one. It's a good demonstration of beneficence at both ends of the extreme, okay? Student nurses made this as a class assignment relating to beneficence. Ethical concerns, responsibilities of the nurse, beneficence. Not enough beneficence or care of good, example.
It's great flavor, too. Oh, <laughs> man, seriously. All right. You know, what, you know what's really upsetting? I had you on my fantasy football team, dude. What, what were you doing? That guy just nailed you. Do we really have to talk about this? My, my career might be over here. Right? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, well, my fantasy football season is over. Is there anything else? Oh, you know what? I'll be right back. Dude, I told you Dude. this here. <laughs> Sweet. Mr. Kincaid, how are you, man? Hey, get a photo of me. Oh, yeah, hey, for sure. Here. I got one. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I need you to sign this too before I go, all right? I'm really not going to do this right Smile. Now. Come on, sign it up. Jeez. Okay, now this is beneficence too much. It's a bit of an extreme example, but you know, it puts the point home. I think we're overdoing it here, aren't we, Elvis? Now we want just right. That checking in for the scale of pain, right? Helping to make the patient more comfortable, right? And ensuring the right medication is given for the right ailment.
now this is just a bit fun I think that is going to give a hit okay So next time we will continue going through the four um, the four pillars. We've got non. What have we got next? Oh, non, non maleficence mm -hmm. and justice. Okay. And then once we've gone through those next two, then we'll look to see and looking at some examples for each one when we have conflicts. Okay. All right. Excellent. That will do for 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 now. Okay. Good stuff.